So now we'll be looking at what's called quantitative genetics. Quantitative genetics is studying genetics, but by using distributions. So as I mentioned before, we're kind of going from the binomial distribution to a normal distribution. So basically we have a normal distribution of the trait, and we're going to kind of keep in mind that down here, those values of the trait are caused by genotypes like this, and up here these values of the trait are caused by genotypes like this, and then different sets of combinations of alleles are producing more individuals, say, in the middle. So when we have a distribution, normal distribution like so, we can measure the width of it. And again, one of the reasons you're interested in the width is because of, as we've seen before, the variation within a population is one of the key things for evolution. So the width of a distribution, if we think about our trait being z, we can measure it with the standard deviation of z is the square root of the variance of z. So if you cast your mind back to statistics where you learned about variances and standard deviations, this overall kind of spread, this variance, is due to several things. The overall phenotypic variance, or variation, but um, variance is a technical term, so it's a mathematical thing you can calculate. The overall phenotypic variance, we'll refer to as VP, it's going to have two components. Some of that variance, right, larger individuals here, is going to come from genes. But then some of that variation is also going to come from the environment. For example, individuals that got more food are more likely to be larger, individuals that got less food are going to be smaller, no matter what their genes are. So this observed overall phenotypic variance is actually going to have contribution from two parts. So this VP is actually going to be the sum of VG and VE. And if you remember from biostatistics, one of the nice things about variances is that they added up, right? When you did the ANOVA, you divided variance into differences between groups and differences within groups. We can do the same thing here. The variance of the phenotype can be divided up into the variance arising from differences between individuals based on their genes and differences between individuals based on their environment. So building on from here, we have our phenotypic variance is the sum of genotypic variance plus environmental variance. Now we can think about the heritability, which is a topic that we had from earlier in the semester. The heritability is basically going to be the amount of the variance due to genes divided by the total, right? So this is telling us the proportion of the overall phenotypic variance that's because of genes. And so that kind of makes sense with our definition of heritability. And when we have this formula of it, we're going to term this the broad sense heritability. Now it turns out that the genetic variance itself can be decomposed into parts. So the genetic variance has a component that comes from an additive effect, a component that comes from dominance effect, and a component that comes from epistatic effects. So genetic variation between individuals is in part due to what are called additive effects. So this is basically, do you have zero or one or two copies of an allele that is changing the trait. It also arises from dominance effects. The variance is influenced by the fact that in some cases having one or two copies makes you different from having zero copies, but there's no difference between one or two copies because of dominance. And then the third part, epistatic, arises from the fact that we know that loci influence each other 
So which alleles an individual has at one locus can influence the effect of the alleles at the second locus. And that also creates genetic variants, or variants because of these sorts of genetic factors. Of these genetic factors, the one that is most consistently inherited from parent to offspring is not this, because that depends on combinations of lots of things. Not this, because since one or two looks the same, and the offspring in combining with the other parent, if you look at the Punnett square, it's not as consistent. But it's the additive effects, right? If a parent has two, they're much more likely to have an offspring that has that phenotype as two. So the most consistent kind of inherited aspect of this genetic variance is actually the additive genetic variance divided by, and then if we put this in context, take that additive genetic variance divided by the overall phenotypic variance, that's going to give us another type of heritability like this one, but now we're just focusing on the consistently inherited genetic effects, kind of not worrying about these ones, which are a little bit more variable, and so we'll call this the narrow sense heritability. And this thing is h squared, and that's the same h squared as we had earlier in the semester from this breeder's equation. So the narrow sense heritability, which we get as a variance component of the genetic variance, is actually the same thing as the heritability we had from earlier this semester. And so to remind you of how this worked earlier this semester, you have a population, choose some individuals to reproduce to make like a selected group, and then they mate to make a new population. And then from them, we have some individuals we choose to make a selected group, and they make the next generation. This process from here to here, that change of the overall population was given by R, the response. And then the difference between the overall population and the selected ones was given by the selective differential. And so the response is the heritability times s, and we can rearrange that to be r over s. And that heritability there is the exact same heritability there. So we have this heritability here from our breeder's equation. We have this heritability from our variance decomposition of phenotypes. So if we do an experiment where we select a population, right, so impose a certain amount of selection, so that'll be a certain amount of selection we impose, and then we measure the response, and then we can do more selection, measure the response, more selection, measure the response. We'll get some sort of pattern like that. And the slope of the line through this will be the heritability, right? Because it's R divided by S. When we do this, we call that heritability, when we do a selection experiment, the realized. heritability. And then we also saw this heritability from another plot where if we have parent means and offspring mean, right, larger parents tend to have larger offspring, smaller parents tend to have smaller offspring, you generally get some sort of pattern like this. That slope is also heritability. This is the narrow sense heritability when we do it like this. So this heritability term comes up um, in multiple different locations, either from doing a selection experiment or if you can determine what proportion of phenotypic variance is from these additive effects, we can calculate it 
or you can actually plot parents versus offspring, three different ways of getting heritability. And remember, heritability ranged from zero to one, where zero indicated a trait that had no genetic component. And that makes sense. That would give us a VA of zero, or we would never get a response if we did selection. All the way to one, which meant the trait was entirely genetically determined, which here would mean that all of the phenotypic variance is due to these additive genetic effects. And you would get the response equal to the selection differential because there would be no kind of other variation. There'd be no differences between individuals other than the alleles that you're selecting, which are completely determining the trait. So heritabilities can be calculated different ways, but there is in fact a danger to using heritabilities from one study and comparing them to others. So if we're comparing heritabilities between populations, it's actually kind of tricky. So we have heritability is VA over VP, right? And VA is the amount of genetic variation of these for these additive or codominant alleles. And then VG plus VE was our overall phenotypic variance. But then if you think about like doing experiments to measure the heritability of a trait, these things can differ quite often. So can you really ever do an experiment where we know that the environment is exactly the same? And uh, the answer to that is no. They've actually done some medical experiments where you take genetically identical mice, put them in the exact same cages, feed them the exact same food, and you can see differences in the phenotypes of these individuals. Even when we do our best in a lab, the environment can differ, which means if you're doing experiments and trying to measure heritability in, say, different populations, since you can never totally control this, it's actually very difficult to get directly comparable heritability values. So for example, people can do experiments and say the heritability of length is 40%, and somebody else can do an experiment, the heritability of length might be 30%. It's not necessarily like either one of them are wrong, it just depends on what the environmental variation is. We also have this kind of rearrangement heritability is the response divided by selection differential. But we know that S is a mix of the strength of selection and the variation. So in fact, if you had less variation in your population when you did an experiment, then that would influence this and you would get different heritability values. So comparing heritability values between different populations is actually very, very difficult. And it means that whenever you read about the results of one study and they've estimated the heritability of something, you should consider that result in a very kind of like narrow manner, right? It applies to the exact population they've been looking at, not necessarily to anything else. And this becomes important for contemporary society because there are lots of studies where people go out and try to um, study, for example, the heritability of IQ, for example, and they can get values, but then those values should be taken with a big grain of salt if we're going to start talking about heritability of IQ or how much of IQ is genetic versus environmental whenever we study any population different from the one that was used to generate that heritability value.